Well, hello, everyone. For this Friday afternoon, I've got Bob Miller. And I know if you've been around this page for a while, you've seen, I think we're on number five. Does that sound right, Bob? Number five, yes. Oh, my gosh. And the, one of the reasons is because people love your information. It's a very high level for the average person, but a lot of our clients, patients, fans, and of course, other doctors are really enjoying the information you bring in today is so relevant. And we had a lot of comments already about can't wait, can't wait to see this. So I know we're going to have a lot of listeners and then even more on the recordings. And like I was telling you right before we got on, Bob, your um, YouTube videos and the ones that we do here have been um, consistently the top performing viewers. So people wow. love your content. And um, I just, I love talking to you. I feel like um, I've got a friend in you and uh, just, and, well, like we said, it's almost like we need to retitle it, two nerds talking about EMF or something like that, right? <laughs> geeking out. Yes. Yeah, geeking I'm, out, I'm, exactly. So yeah, I um, look forward to these as well. So much fun, really. Good. It is. It's just like great, great information and great, uh, I think we, we uh, you know, go back and forth well on the different points. Um, so just a little background. If you haven't been here before, you can find my free blog, newsletter, all kinds of free resources at my website, jillcarnahan.com. You can find products at drjillhealth.com. And if you haven't subscribed to the YouTube channel, you definitely want to do that. That way you won't miss any of these videos. Um, they're live here and then they're reposted on YouTube just a couple of days after and they are um, there. There's over 50 videos now. So if you want to see, if you like Bob Miller and want to see more, they are all living there on YouTube and every single one of them is fantastic information and still very relevant. So be sure and go there and see the previous episodes that we've done. Um, Bob Miller, you've heard me, uh, needs no introduction. He's um, a leader of uh, Tree of Life Health and Nutrigenomic in, um, Research. He puts on conferences for practitioners um, and just all around just what I love is he's always looking for new things, new ideas, bringing us new information in this realm of epigenetics and genetics research. So without further ado, Bob, uh, thanks for coming on again. And let's dive right into how cell phones and EMF and Wi-Fi might be damaging your health. Absolutely. Well, thank you for this opportunity. Always such fun to be with you. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have we, we geek out together, as we uh, as we said. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the things I, uh, I find fascinating, if someone wants to uh, be entertained or somewhat surprised, uh, go on YouTube sometime and, and search for 1940s cigarette commercials. And uh, what you will find is that there are commercials with either doctors or someone, you know, acting as a doctor saying that, you know, doctors are busy and they're stressed and they prefer camel cigarettes. And it shows a physician sitting there puffing on his camel cigarettes. Wow. And you can find commercials that recommend that uh, pregnant women uh, should smoke cigarettes to help deal with uh, with stress. So back in the 1940s, uh, people just thought smoking cigarettes was pretty cool because it does relax you a little bit and, you know, makes you feel a little more calm. And it was a social thing at the time. And if anyone would have said that uh, cigarette smoking is, is harmful, they would have said, well, I've smoked for five years and I'm fine. There's no problem here. Uh, 20 years later, uh, emphysema and lung cancer. And I don't say we know this for sure, but I think there's a very high possibility that we're going to look back on cell phones and Wi-Fi and the chronic EMF that we're exposed to possibly in the same light. You know, I know probably you and I sometimes talk to people about cell phones and Wi-Fi and they kind of scoff, oh, that can't do anything. I don't feel anything. I hold my cell phone and I'm okay. And uh, But what I'm afraid of, and uh, as we looked at the literature that we're going to go through today, the long-term effects might be more serious than we ever realized. So we might be having today our 1940s version of, uh, of cigarettes. So uh, I encourage people to go look at them and they'll um, be somewhat shocked at, uh, at what they see. Bob, I want to just mention one thing that really, um, I was, I've been at conferences with environmental health, your conferences, EMF conferences, my, you know, decades now. Um, but one thing that really struck me probably four or five years ago was one of the EMF experts presented a woman who had, and this is published in the literature. This is not just like a story from a doctor um, of, of who uh, put her cell phone in her bra for many years and she developed a tumor and they didn't think a whole lot of it. But then when they looked at the radiograph, it really was the outline of her cell phone and the exact placement where she had placed it in her bra to carry that. And they actually later wrote up this, the, the, um, evidence and probably as we'll learn today she had some genetic polymorphisms that made her more susceptible because that, obviously that didn't happen to everyone but it was a case study of a clinically relevant emf long-term exposure in breast cancer 
And so, and again, there's been lots of brain tumors due to the changes in glucose metabolism with being right by your head because part of the EMF is the, um, ex the distance is very, very relevant. So that's why if you are checking on your cell phone speaker or the air um, pods where you don't have the radiation from the Wi-Fi and the Bluetooth are gonna be more protective. So just a little backstory. I remember seeing that story of the breast and being so profoundly like, wow, like it was undeniable, the evidence in that case study of the connection in that particular woman. Sure, and what are guys doing? Putting in their pockets six mm -hmm. inches from their prostate. Yep. And uh, there's probably multiple factors involved with this, but sperm rates have dropped 53% since 1973. Wow. And we don't have to get down to zero until we're infertile. Absolutely. And uh, I think someday we're going to look back and say, what were we thinking putting radio transmitters in our heads? You know, so, <laughs> that's a, you know, and I know it's convenient and all, but uh, I think someday we're going to look back and say, oops, to that. All right, well, let's, uh, let's dig in here. Let's do a screen share. And uh, as you know, for people who have seen us before, you know, what we always do is we just don't give opinions. We bring up peer reviewed studies. And uh, so our subject is how cell phones and Wi-Fi may be harming your health. And of course, all of this is for educational, informational. We're not diagnosing or treating any disease. I call this the 3D chess game played underwater. It's complex. You know, sometimes people are looking for simple answers. You know, what is the SNP? What is the thing? But typically it is multiple factors going together. So here we have our scuba divers totally perplexed over this 3D chess game. And I believe that's what we have going on, multiple factors. Now, tonight what we're gonna be talking about is um, EMF and antioxidants defense system. Now let's talk a little bit about free radicals and antioxidants. I mean, probably most of the people on here know what they are, but just a quick review. You know, it's everything is made out of atoms and you've got the neutron and the proton and the electron. I mean, this goes back to fifth or sixth grade uh, science. That needs to be balanced. A free radical is when one of those electrons gets ripped off and it's called a free radical. Antioxidants have a spare electron and they neutralize that, that's called an antioxidant. And you know, the traditional naturopathic philosophy that went way back was that excess inflammation or excess free radicals was the primary consideration in many of the problems we're having. And when you look at most of the diseases we're seeing today, especially some of those that we haven't seen before, clearly free radical damage is a factor. So it really comes down to, are you producing more free radicals than you are antioxidants? Now there's three major antioxidants. One is called glutathione, and we'll dig into that a little bit more later, but it's the master antioxidant. And glutathione does a couple of things. It takes out toxins like mold and other things through glutathione conjugation. It is also involved with something called glutathione peroxidase that clears hydrogen peroxide. And it goes through a process of being made, recycled, used. And if that gets disrupted, it's not going to be working very well. So when we talk about mold, you know, sometimes people live in a house and one person is terribly impacted by the mold. And the other one says, what mold? I don't think there's any mold in here. You must be imagining this. Well, the difference between them may be that the one person had other things that made them more toxic, or they may have genetic predisposition that they don't clear that mold as well and more impacted. I just spoke to a lady just this week. If she walks down the sidewalk and someone has their dryer running and the fumes from the dryer comes out, it makes her sick. That's how difficult a time she has with detoxification. Superoxide dismutase, that's another antioxidant that neutralizes the superoxide free radical. And then there's a third antioxidant called catalase. And that has many functions in the body, but for our purposes today, we're gonna to be talking about how it clears something called hydrogen peroxide. And one of the ways you can know if you're not clearing your hydrogen peroxide well, is if you gray prematurely, because and there's other factors as well. But if we don't have enough antioxidants, like catalase, to clear our hydrogen peroxide, many times we'll gray prematurely. Just right before this, I talked to a gentleman who's had lifelong health problems, and I said, when did you start to gray? He said, my mid-20s. Wow. So that's a good indication that you don't have enough clearing of hydrogen peroxide. Now, EMF, that stands for electromagnetic fields. 
Now, as you know, when you your electricity, that runs at 60 cycles per second. In other words, it goes one direction and the other direction 60 times per second. And then as you get into, you know, AM and FM radio, cell phones, Wi-Fi, uh, microwaves, they're all just different frequencies. In other words, the frequency that they're, they're going at. So that whole spectrum would be considered electromagnetic fields. Now, three things we're going to be looking at today. One is called the Fenton reaction, discovered in 1895 by Dr. Fenton. And what he discovered was that hydrogen peroxide collides with iron to make something called hydroxyl radicals. And we'll show that in a chart. Nitric oxide is very important. It's won a Nobel Prize back in the late 1980s. And it's related to circulation, calming down uh, inflammation, and many other things. And something can happen called Nasson coupling, where rather than creating nitric oxide, it creates peroxynitrite. Now, I can't remember if it was our first or second interview, Dr. Jill. I believe it was one of those that we talked about peroxynitrite. So as you said, some of those interviews are quite uh, still relevant. So if someone would like to learn more, go back to that original interview we did on uh, peroxynitrite. And then the EMF, it also creates something called interleukin-6, IL-6. And that was the last interview we've done. And I, and I just noticed on YouTube, that's one of the most uh, downloaded and, and viewed. So uh, very honored by that. But I believe that multiple environmental factors are upregulating this cytokine. And again, we're not going to repeat all that data just a little bit. But I would really encourage people to go back and listen to that interview in IL-6. And then finally, we're going to tie it all together, how when people get genetic mutations, that amplifies the effect. So that's why one person can say they're sensitive to EMF, and the other person says, uh, you must be a little crazy because that couldn't be a problem. So many times people who have EMF sensitivity not only have that problem, but a stigma as though they're making it up or, or, or doing something like that. Uh, I'm sure you run into that uh, in your practice as well. People are EMF sensitive, and... They're, they're ashamed that there must be something that they're imagining. Do you ever run into that, Dr. J? Yes, and I actually like that you mentioned that because even the topic and the title, it seems like it's like this political thing. It's not, guys. This is real science. This is just legitimate stuff that is happening out there. The difference is that, which is why it seems like maybe pseudoscience, there is, which is why we're going into this today, there is a difference in genetic variation and susceptibility. So there are people who are probably minimally affected by EMF, and there's others that are massively affected by EMF. And that's, again, why we're talking about this today and why the science, um, again, there's good science on this. This is clear, um, very uh, measurable. <laughs> this is not anything pseudoscience, but it's variable in this presentation. Absolutely. You know, and sometimes back to smoking, every once in a while, you'll see somebody that lives to 100 years old and they say, what's your, what's your secret? Oh, I have a cigar every day. Right. You know? And uh, so there's a person that uh, probably did not have a genetic predisposition to smoking. Somebody else could smoke for 15 years and be having emphysema and lung cancer. So we're each impacted differently. And that's why I think it's so important that we do personalized care uh, because each person is unique, you know, even in many things. You know, some people, we, you know, when we talked about histamine, we talked about how for some people, you know, the fermented foods is just the right thing for them to help their gut. For the next person, fermented foods makes them ill. Mm -hmm. And we see that time and time again, that everyone is uh, unique. So one of my favorite sayings is we've got to get away from the pill for the ill and really start looking at the person individually. Mm -hmm. All right, let's dig in. Now, again, we go with peer reviewed studies. We just don't make things up. We don't get things from blogs. So uh, I think most people know that when you when you see this, the, all these came from PubMed, where somebody wrote it. There's a lot of scientists involved. Somebody reviews it before it gets uh, published. So here's an article, Effects of Electromagnetic Field Exposure on the Antioxidant Defense System. So again, antioxidants is what neutralizes those free radicals that hurts us. I summarize over here the, the points of this study, and it's a long study. But it says oxidative stress occurs if the antioxidants defense system, that's your antioxidants, is unable to prevent the harmful effects of free radicals. Several studies have reported that exposure to EMF results in oxidative stress in many tissues of the body. Exposure to EMF is known to increase free radical concentrations. Now, we're going to go a little bit farther here, and it says, 
the cytotoxic effect from EMF derived from peroxidation of the membrane phospholipids. This creates a change in the conductivity of the membrane and loss of the membrane integrity. Final comment in there, exposure to EMF has been observed to cause increased free radical production in the cellular environment. Now, one of the things we often hear is, you know, people use the argument that we don't get any thermal heating. And if we don't get any heating from it, because it's well known that if you get like next to a, a an FM radio station with 50,000 watts and you're 10 feet away from it, you're going to get a burn. Mm -hmm. And so that the thought has been that if you don't have thermal heating, uh, you're not going to have uh, any problems at all. But here it's saying a significant part of many studies have investigated the non-thermal effects. So if someone tells you if it doesn't heat the tissue, it can't be a problem, uh, that theory may not be uh, correct anymore. Going on further, it says living organisms have antioxidant mechanisms such as glutathione, GSH, glutathione peroxidase. That is how it uses glutathione to clear hydrogen peroxide catalase and superoxide dismutase to alleviate the damage caused by that ROS, which is reactive oxygen species. Now, what we're going to show a little bit later is you can have genetic mutations that you inherit from your parents, where you may not make enough glutathione, you may not recycle it, you may not make enough catalase, you may not make enough SOD. These are the people that don't have the antioxidant mechanisms. And it's that proverbial straw that breaks the camel's back. It doesn't take much oxidative stress to push them over the edge. So this defense mechanism acts by suppressing or impairing the chain reaction triggered by the reactive oxygen species. Now, this is interesting. Antioxidant defense mechanisms are impaired by being subjected to an agent that causes overproduction of reactive oxygen species, including EMF. So the net result is oxidative stress. So what we see here is that we are making too many free radicals and if we don't have enough antioxidants we're going to have a problem. And I think that holds true not only for EMF but many of the things that we spoke about. You know our last interview we talked about IL-6. Multiple things we spoke about that create reactive uh, oxygen species. Now here's a study that says, although non-thermal effects do not raise the body temperature sufficiently, their effects can still be seen as an increase in free radical production in tissues. I can't tell you how many times I've spoken to folks about, well, be careful with your cell phones. Don't charge it next to your bed. And you know, what's, what's really scary is sometimes some teenagers decide they don't want to miss a text message. So you put your cell phone under your pillow. That's yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> or, uh, right. The brain, and that's what I was saying earlier. One of the things we know is this affects brain glucose metabolism. I and mean, this is also in the literature. So the closer, if you, granted, we don't want it in the breast, we don't want it near the prostate, we don't want any of those things. But at least, please don't put it right by your head because that I think is the worst of all. One thing, Bob, as I'm hearing you with the reactive oxygen species, we know these are a big deal. And just a practical tip, I think that's why both you and I are huge fans of the hydrogen tabs. And both of us have the hydrogen inhaled um, that we often use. I use it almost every day. Would you say that's a real good general way that we can combat reactive oxygen is either hydrogen tablets or inhaled hydrogen? Oh, absolutely. And we're going to be talking about the Fenton Perfect. reaction very Perfect. soon. And, and the Fenton reaction, of course, is where we make those hydroxyl radicals, OH minus, OH minus plus H2 equals H2O. Water. So, yeah, water. So we can, uh, we can take those free radicals and turn them into uh, to water. And I know a lot of people find that hard to believe. It's like, I mean, I drop this pill in the water and all of a sudden it becomes uh, helpful, you know, but it does because water, of course, is H2O. Drop a pill in or a capsule or tablet it knocks the hydrogen loose as it fizzes, and if you drink it quickly, you get the hydrogen. Yeah. So here it says, EMFs, no matter where they occur, are reported to cause a rise in the level of free oxy or oxygen free radicals in an experimental environment, hold on your hat, in plants and humans. So uh, scary stuff. We have no idea what we've done. When you think about how quickly uh, We've acclimated ourselves to cell phones and Wi-Fi, and in our schools, we're putting Wi-Fi up in the ceilings, and uh, we're putting uh, cell towers on the schools and in churches, and 
Uh, I many times you, when uh, when you look at a hotel, many times the, uh, the the cell towers are at the top of the hotel. So if you're sitting in that room, uh, you're being bombarded with uh, EMF. Now we're going to talk about the Fenton reaction, 1895 by Dr. Fenton. And when you think about it, Dr. Jill, isn't it amazing that back in 1895, before we knew these things, someone was figuring the Fenton reaction out? So it's quite amazing. Yeah. Astonishing. Yeah. So this is where we take hydrogen peroxide, a product of mitochondrial oxidative respiration. Yeah, and that's the same thing that you put on cuts into a highly toxic hydroxyl free radicals. So studies have suggested that EMF is yet another mechanism through the Fenton reaction, creating free radical, act, free radical activity in the cells. And uh, when I do consults, uh, health consults, or when I, in my software that I developed, that uh, the doctors use, one of the first things we look at, is there a potential for a Fenton reaction? And there's a couple patterns that uh, make people more susceptible to that, and we'll talk about that. But before we get to Fenton reaction, uh, here's, the, uh, here's the PubMed articles. EMFs have been shown to have the potential to stimulate reactive oxygen species, including superoxide, via activation of an enzyme called NADPH oxidase. Now, I would encourage people to go back and listen to the video we did. We spent an hour, an hour and a half talking about NADPH oxidase. This is an interesting enzyme. The short version is when we're faced with a pathogen or something coming into the body that shouldn't be there. I mean, what a miracle we really are. It says, hey, you don't belong here. The NOx enzyme says, hey, Mr. Iron, give me some oxygen, something called NADPH, give me an electron, and I'm going to start shooting some bullets. It starts shooting superoxide and hydrogen peroxide. It stimulates cytokines, mast cells, histamine, it's going for the kill. And if we didn't have that, we'd die of infection. However, it's kind of like a military that protects us from the enemy, but we have a real problem if the military starts shooting the citizens. It's called autoimmune disease. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure, Dr. Jill, you are seeing many more children now with autoimmune disease, like ulcerative colitis and inflammatory bowel disease, than you did when you started practicing. I mean, this is just skyrocketing. Epidemic. One of the things with statistics is each of these autoimmunities is in silos. So we have the rheumatologist seeing the um, arthritis, we have the neurologist seeing the MS, we have the gastroenterologist seeing the Crohn's colitis, et cetera, et cetera. And so each of these silos feels like a separate entity. It's all the same mechanism. And so if we put it all together, it's the fourth leading cause of mortality among men and women in the US. Absolutely. I mean, autoimmune disease is just skyrocketing. So it also activates nitric oxide synthase, which combines with superoxide to make peroxynitrite, and it decreases the antioxidant activity of superoxide dismutase. This sounds like a rather perilous thing to me. What do you think, Dr. Jill, if it does all of those things? Sounds incredibly dangerous. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. One of my favorite drawings, I, I probably refer to this uh, every day. So you can see here, um, you have inside the cell, you know, you'll make some, and I'll see if I can draw on here. Let me get my, let me get my drawing tool here. Okay. So inside the cell, sometimes an electron flies off and combines with oxygen to make superoxide. Then superoxide dismutase comes along and makes hydrogen peroxide. Then if we have adequate catalase, glutathione peroxidase, and glutathione that feeds that, and we have enough peroxidase and thriodoxin, we turn this guy into plain ordinary water. But there's a lot that can go wrong here. Your glutathione can be used up elsewhere. You can have genetic mutations that you don't make enough. And then, you know, you and I did another whole webinar on NADPH, one of my favorite molecules. If we don't make enough of this, or we have the NADPH steel that we explained in those videos, we don't recycle these guys, the hydrogen peroxide stays high. Here comes iron and we have hydroxyl radicals. Quick Oxidized. question for you, Bob, as you're talking about this, you talked about in the beginning and we had some questions about this because everybody's like, oh, gray hair. How do we fix that? And we're saying we know the cause partially. We don't necessarily have the cure. 
but I mean, if we could reverse this, yes. But, but what I'm wondering there is you're talking about that hydrogen peroxide and iron. Do you think that there's an increased risk of early premature grain in those with hemochromatosis genetics? Could that be inferred or is that going too far from where you mentioned that? Well, tough to say, because I've seen people that have the, the overabsorption of the iron and they're making the hydroxyl radicals. So, I mean, I'm totally speculating here, but I think if this reaction is going on in mass, yeah. they don't get the grain. What I've observed is if you don't have the excess iron and you don't clear the hydrogen peroxide, these are the people that gray prematurely. Got it. So it's actually maybe the opposite. It's actually the iron is, is, is uh, instigating that reaction to OH. Uh, yes. Right. Mm -hmm. Then that will go on to um, combine with INOS, the, uh, the nitric oxide version that's more reactive, mm -hmm. and oh no, peroxy nitrite, which of course we know is very oxidizing. So interestingly, one of the first uh, research projects we did, we, we researched those people with chronic Lyme, because as you know, some people have Lyme, they didn't even know they had it. Mm -hmm. Others, you know, one dose of antibiotics takes care of them. Others, you know, they're sick for years, can't seem to get over it. We studied those people, and interestingly, they had a five time higher probability of having the gene that would cause them to absorb more iron. And uh, we presented that in Helsinki, Finland in 2016, and very honored that we got the research award for, uh, for my lads at the international conference. Wow. Now, what are some of the things that can cause this to happen? Okay, there is a, a, a gene mutation called HFE. And when this is mutated, in other words, when you get a genetic polymorphism from your parent, your potential for increased iron absorption, very, very common among the English, the Irish, some Germans, and particularly the Ashkenazi Jews. Mm -hmm. Now, what's interesting, during times of famine, this was actually to your benefit. So particularly in Ireland, during the times of potato famine, the women who had this genetic mutation were the ones that were healthy enough to have the babies. So it was an adaptive mutation back then. Very interesting, Bob, because I have one copy of that one. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe you have some English Irish roots there, yeah. my friend. So, All right, SLC41, I am really intrigued by this one. Uh, this is the only iron exporter. And generally when I see a lot of mutations in here, these people many times have massive inflammation and an interesting things happen. We say to them, well, you know, you've got the gene that can cause the extra absorption of the iron. And they'll tell me, well, that can't be right. I've been told I'm anemic my whole life. So when the iron gets stuck in the cell and makes inflammation and blood levels can actually be normal to low. And these are the people that if they take iron, they feel horrible. You know, so some well-meaning health professional says, your iron's low, take iron. And it's like, wow, that just threw me for a loop. Um, ceruloplasm, of course, is needed for the proper use of iron. So if we don't have enough of that, the iron can become a free radical. Transferrin factor and transferrin factor two, overabsorption of iron. And then as we said, if you have genetic mutations in catalase, superoxide dismutase, keep in mind, superoxide is the free radical superoxide dismutase is the antioxidant. Glutathione peroxidase clears the hydrogen peroxide. TXN and PRDX, they clear hydrogen peroxide and peroxynitrite. We also need vitamin A for the proper use of, uh, of iron. There's an enzyme called BCMO1 that converts beta carotene to vitamin A. Mutations here will not allow that to work as well. And I don't know if you've ever seen someone who wanted to become a health nut, they drank lots of carrot juice and yes. turned orange. Yes. Because they didn't convert their beta carotene to vitamin A. G6PD, ME1, they create that NADPH, which recycles the antioxidants. So you can see here when people are saying, well, what's the gene involved? It's like, well, we don't have one of those. It can be any one of these or any combination. Just Bob Miller observing, HFE and SLC40A1 together is a problem. G6PD and glutathione together is a problem. And for the more you have, the more it uh, piles up on you. Now, let's look at this. That was the Fenton reaction. So maybe let me go back to this uh, chart. So my whole point here is if 
the EMF makes more superoxide, then you're going to have more hydrogen peroxide. And the more trouble you have over here combined with iron, the more likely you're to have the Fenton reaction. Now let's move on to another method that we can make all these free radicals. It says the initial stage of the reactive oxygen species production in the presence of radio frequencies is controlled by the NADPH oxidase enzyme. Now again, we've done a whole series, a whole video on this, and uh, we, we call it the home cycle, where the NOx enzyme, and remember we just talked about this briefly, a fascinating enzyme. Without this, we die. We wouldn't be protected. So it is our protection. So when we're invaded by a foreign invader, NOx enzyme says, we got a problem. Iron, give me some oxygen. NADPH, give me an electron. Let's kick up some mast cells, some superoxide, some histamine, and kill this. Without it, we die of infection. If you knock out this enzyme, the animal dies of infection. However, I'm firmly convinced there's so many environmental factors. And if somebody's interested in this, go back and watch that video. I'm not going to repeat them all now. Watch that video where we talk about all the environmental factors that overstimulate this, make the mast cells, make the superoxide, and then make the histamine. So what happens then is that there's something called the RAAS, the renin angiotensin system, that will crank up and make aldosterone and stimulate our nemesis IL-6. And interestingly, IL-6 stimulates NOx, NOx stimulates IL-6. And we just get this positive feedback loop where this thing just feeds upon itself. So the more EMF creates the, um, the superoxide, the more that just makes more peroxynitrite. And in multiple ways, this feeds upon itself. So again, I would encourage everyone to watch that video. And again, I don't have time to get into it here today, but again, 3D chess game. All of these little yellow boxes over here are, are genes or enzymes. Mutations in any of these could make this whole process spin more quickly. So if someone says, well, what's the genetic predisposition to the home cycle? It's like, we don't have one of those. You know, it's a combination of multiple environmental factors combined with perhaps multiple genetic factors. And that's what makes it uh, so complex. So if somebody says, well, what's the supplement or medication to take? Like, I don't know if we have one of those because it's going to be unique for each person. And it just Bob Miller opinion. Uh, I believe that upregulation of this is why we're seeing so much autism, ADD, autoimmune disease. I believe that many of the people that are struggling today had they been born 75 years earlier, may not be the healthiest person, but wouldn't be as sick as they are today. Bob, We're I couldn't agree them. more because it's really this environmental toxic load. And part of it's the EMF, part of it's the chemicals, part of it's the mold, part of it's, there's so many viral loads and infectious and tick-borne infections. All of these are on the rise. So even for me, 20 years ago or 15 years ago, treating patients, um, there was less complexity and people got better quicker. And I've seen even in that short decade, there's been a massive uh, dis difference in how quickly and how, how, first of all, how quickly people get better and how complex the illness is now. And I think it is directly related because toxic environmental insults, as you can clearly see there in your diagram, will all stimulate NOx. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, when, when I talk to uh, elementary school teachers who've just taught five years, and I'll say, how are the kids different today than five years ago? Every one of them says, more difficulty concentrating, mm -hmm. more angry, more frustrated. Mm -hmm. When I talk to college professors, tell me about the boys. They're fragile. That's the word they keep using, fragile. They get upset quickly. Uh, I spoke to a gentleman who is a, uh, a Texas Ranger, and he said he's still in contact with the, uh, with the organization and they constantly have to lower the standards of yeah. physical fitness because they wouldn't have anybody that could apply anymore because mm -hmm. the boys are not as strong as they were 20, 30 years ago. And if you'd listen to Dr. Thea Hardy, as he believes that um, autism, mast cells are playing a significant role in that as it creates the neuroinflammation. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that concerns me is, uh, you know, turn on the news for 10 minutes 
and the amount of anger that people have, uh, even on on political views. I mean, families break apart, friends stop talking to each other because they have differing political views. In the past, you know, we could have different views on politics, but not hate each other. You know, now we're seeing such a rise in anger. And uh, the only thing I put on Facebook is, uh, here's my recent interview with uh, with Dr. Jill. <laughs> I'm not getting involved in conversations, you know, so. Because uh, everybody will lash out at you. So this, I just, one of my researchers just found this and I just about fell mm -hmm. off my chair. As we know, wow. some people get COVID, they don't even know they had it. Others are like, eh, I had a cough and a sore throat, wasn't all that bad. Others are gasping for breath on ventilators and dying. And this was uh, just, you know, recently published, just December 15th. Just going to read the bottom line here. Taking into account all these evidences, we propose that pre-existing Knox pathway dysregulation could be a determining factor in the development of the severe form of COVID-19 infection. So this isn't saying determines whether you get it or not, or whether you fight it off or not, but whether you have the severe infection and the onset of the complications worsening the clinical outcomes of the disease. So I think this is incredibly significant. And, um, and I think that uh, one of the concerns a lot of people have is if COVID would have hit 50 years ago, would it be as serious as it is today? Then it goes on to say, the data discussed in this present opinion paper suggests that reducing oxidative stress could improve the poor outcomes that characterizes severe COVID-19. Due to the central role exerted by Knox's pathway dysregulation and related oxidative stress in the main comorbidity associated to severe COVID-19, and considering its involvement in the SARS-CoV viral infection mechanism, targeting NOx enzymes seems a promising strategy to treat COVID-19 to prevent the severe complications. So I suspect what they're talking about here is, you know, medications that may inhibit NOx. And uh, that's, that's fine. But another way to go about this is find out what environmental factors are stimulating my NOx might have might i have a genetic predisposition that they harm me more than others and then take some uh, some active steps now i don't want anybody to say that uh, you know cell phones is causing the problem with COVID because i think it's much more complex than that but i think what we can see from this it's got to be a contributing factor for some individuals i was really intrigued by this drawing that was part of that study and this was new to me. The virus comes in, of course, we all know it comes in using ACE2, stimulates NOx, and this was new to me. It inhibits NERF2 antioxidant response. Uh, we want to, I want to have my research team get on this. No idea how it does it. But for those who don't know, NERF2, when we're faced with inflammation, NERF2 signals the production of, the usage of, and the recycling of our glutathione and other antioxidants. So if we crank up the NOx enzymes to make more inflammation and we tamp down our antioxidant response, what are we going to have? A lot of reactive oxygen species going on. And uh, potentially this is a factor that's involved with why, you know, some people breeze through and other people on ventilators and, uh, and pass away. I mean, I'm sure there's other factors as well, but I think this has to go... Uh, into the uh, to the mix. So I was a little uh, stunned by this uh, study because as you know, Dr. Jill, we've been talking about the NOx enzyme for a long time. Yeah, it's it pulls it all together, doesn't it, Bob? I keep finding these things too. I'm like, oh, like LPS endotoxemia and the same cytokines like IL-6 are upregulated. So no wonder that diabetics and cardiovascular disease and some of the other predisposing factors that are related to LPS often have worse outcomes in COVID. It just makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the more inflamed you are going into it, uh, the more potential there is. All right, back to uh, EMF. We spoke about superoxide dismutase. Now we're going to talk about glutathione. It's an antioxidant, an important cellular defense, a defense agent against oxidative damage. It reacts with the free radicals in the cell and reduces the entry of hydrogen peroxides. It also prevents the oxidation of sulfur groups 
in the protein structure. So there's plenty of information out there that uh, the lower your glutathione goes, the sooner, uh, the sooner you die from all causes. So we have to have glutathione to do this reduction of all of these uh, free radicals. Now, the uh, interestingly, we were just talking about this before the, the show started, and uh, we're talking about glutathione is especially important for the activity of glutathione peroxidase and glutathione reductase. This is what takes the oxidized back to the reduced. And uh, I am absolutely convinced mutations in this are more significant than we've ever realized. Uh, and we can talk about that at the end if we have a little bit of time. So here they studied the effects of a 900 megahertz EMF for two hours a day for 45 days in rats. They reported that catalase and glutathione peroxidase activities decreased significantly compared to a control group. And as you said earlier, you know, this is now science. This isn't just tin hat. I think, you know, cell phones are hurting us. Um, similarly, an increase in lipid peroxidation and, uh, and in studies, I never heard demolition, but that's an interesting word in glutathione levels were seen in all lymphoid organs after EMF exposure, suggesting that increased levels of lipid peroxidation may have been a consequence of depleted glutathione stores. So there it is, peer-reviewed literature that it's decreasing our catalase and glutathione peroxidase activities. Going back to what you said about the hydrogen water, hydrogen water supports the production of glutathione. So that's why that can be uh, by so vitally uh, important. Because clearly we're not going to get rid of our cell phones and our Wi-Fi, but uh, you know we have to do things that may lessen the potential that it uh, that harms us. So here's catalase. It's a common enzyme present in organisms exposed to oxygen. It's in uh, fruits, vegetables, and animals. It catalyzes the reaction that degrades hydrogen peroxide to water and oxygen. And remember, we said that uh, hydrogen peroxide combines with iron to make hydroxyl radicals. It's a crucial enzyme in the protection of the cell against oxidative damage caused by the free radicals. And what does the EMF do? It reduces it. Now, here's another study. These researchers observed a decrease in catalase levels in an EMF-exposed group. They reported that EMF exposure led to depression of antioxidant systems because of raised lipid peroxidation and generation of free radicals. Mobile phones triggered oxidative damage in the living cell by increasing the levels of xanthine oxidase and carbonyl group activity and reducing catalase activity. Sounds like a train wreck to me, Dr. Jill. Uh, absolutely. It's unbelievable how this all pulls together. Then back to SOD. SOD is an enzyme that catalyzes the reaction in which toxic superoxide is taken to molecular oxygen or hydrogen peroxide. Superoxide is generated as a byproduct of a result of the oxygen metabolism, as we talked about, leading to several types of damage to cells. And this study reported that 50-day exposure to EMF causes oxidative stress levels by increasing MDA levels and consequently reducing your superoxide dismutase activity. Now, interestingly, for both catalase and superoxide dismutase, there's your enzymes that are made from your DNA. Mutations in those mean you're at more risk. In other words, the more it gets lowered by just the way you were born, then there's more of an effect on these outside exposures. So what are some of the genetic mutations that decrease catalase, SOD, and glutathione? GCLM and GCLS. And, uh, you know, it might be a good idea just to, uh, to pull a map over here and to talk about glutathione a little bit. Mm -hmm. Glutathione is made from cysteine. That's why sometimes people take NAC, and acetylcysteine glycine, and glutamate. GCLM and GCLC is what makes this occur. You can have mutations in here but hold on to your hat, mold will inhibit this. Mm. So what do a lot of people do? They're inflamed and they think, well, I need more glutathione. I'm gonna take some NAC, N-acetylcysteine. NAC, as it's called, if all goes well, we'll come down in here and make glutathione. However, if you've got mutations or mold, that doesn't happen. 
And many people know that cysteine can come down what's called the transsulfuration pathway. Mm -hmm. okay. And if we have any difficulty, so here's cysteine over here. So if it's an excess, sulfites are very inflammatory. If we've got problems with suox, not enough molybdenum or not enough heme, that sulfite doesn't turn into sulfate. And guess what sulfite does? It stimulates the NOx enzyme. Oops. And cysteine will also combine with iron to make hydroxyl radicals. Mm -hmm. So under the wrong conditions, we can think we're doing something good for ourselves by taking NAC to make glutathione. And lo and behold, we're making ourselves worse. Mm. Well, so that's I, why I, very, I think I've probably said this before. Of course, I have all of these personal experiences, but years ago, I could not take NAC and it was exactly this. I had uh, one way that patients might be able to tell if their doctor checks organic acids and there's high cysteine and taurine in the urine. That's often that CBS upregulation and the metabolism of of the NAC or any of those precursors in the pathways you were describing. And for me, it presented as pain, like shoulder, neck, stiffness, and pain. And I remember the day I took my first one milligram of molybdenum and I was like, oh, I feel really good. And you, you and I are like, oh, of course, right? At the time I didn't understand the pathway, but it was magical how for me, molybdenum was like a, a anti-inflammatory or a pain pill because it took care of that excess sulfite issue um, before I, I knew what was going on. Now, now that I've detoxed from mold, I can take a lot of NAC without any issues. So part of this is like we talked about personalization of medicine, the order of operations and the doctor working with you is so crucial because if you give some of these beautiful nutrients at the wrong time, you can actually make the the patient worse. Absolutely. And just as a quick note, NERF2, a nuclear transaction factor, is what controls this. Mm -hmm. HEAP1 holds on to NERF2. So I often give the analogy, think of NERF2 as somewhat of a sprinkler system that turns on water when there's a fire. HEAP1 is kind of like the, uh, the valve that holds the water back and the heat sensor. So KEEP, as the name implies, holds on to NERF2. Mm -hmm. And when fire comes along, meaning inflammation, KEEP1 releases NERF2 and it says, okay guys, let's make some glutathione, let's assemble it, let's use it to take things out and let's recycle it. However, we've just found one KEEP1 that's very pathological mm -hmm. and that it actually, now hang, hang on to your head, this sounds backwards. It makes KEEP1 stronger. Keep in mind, keep one holds back nerf two. So if keep one is too strong, nerf two doesn't get released. But interestingly, there's other variants that make keep one more active. And to really make it complicated, if you get a cancer cell, you want your body to make oxidative stress to kill the cancer cell. So if nerf two is too active, it can protect the cancer cell. So back to 3D chess game played underwater. But the one that I see most often, and possibly because of my demographics, the keep one is holding on a nerf two too strongly. Combine a nerf two mutation that makes nerf two weaker, and then mutations in any of these, it's a real train wreck. Now, for the doctors who are listening to this, and they might be doing genomics, I'd like to pass on what I believe might be one of our most important discoveries. Genetic mutation in keep one that holds this stronger genetic mutations in NERF2, it makes it weaker, and genetic mutations in GSR, glutathione S reductase, that takes your oxidized glutathione back to the reduced. We're observing that in the sickest of the sick. Mm. Those who just cannot get on top of their inflammation. Bob, I think that's important enough. I want you to repeat that just for people listening, because they'll be like, what did Jesus say? And it can re rewind, but go ahead and say that one more time, because that was a really sure. important point. Yeah, I believe this is one of our most important uh, research right. findings. So, Glutathione is what neutralizes your toxins, neutralizes your hydrogen peroxide. It starts out in reduced, and after it does its job, it goes to oxidized. We need NADPH and GSR to take it back from oxidized to reduced. NERF2 controls GSR and, and all of them. NERF2 is released to do its job by KEEP1. There's this one RS number that makes keep one stronger, mm -hmm. meaning it holds on. So when the fire starts, it kind of says, fire? What fire? I don't see a fire. You see a fire? So 
then it doesn't respond. But more importantly, if GSR is not doing its job, oxidized glutathione doesn't come back to reduced. Mm -hmm. Now, also NADPH is a cofactor. And we won't go into a lot of detail here, but if you watch our video on the NADPH steel, NADPH, fascinating molecule. It's used to take oxidized back to reduced, but it's also used by the NOx enzyme to make inflammation. So this same electron can be used to make inflammation or reduce inflammation. That's why I call it the NADPH steel. But bottom line is, if this oxidized doesn't get back to the reduced, <clears throat> this oxidized combines with oxygen to make superoxide, nitric oxide to make peroxynitrite, depleting our glutathione, oxidizing our, and damaging our DNA. So how ironic is it that under the wrong conditions, cysteine or glutathione can make you inflamed and reduce your glutathione? Mm. So again, for the doctors who do this work, I just point out, this is our latest discovery. The keep one that's up regulation, nerve two down regulation, and particularly when people have homozygous on GSR, these are the people that are barely functioning. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've seen it in some of the most severe cases of autism where the children don't speak. Um, you know, they just are violent. Um, they, uh, they, they cannot function. So it's too early to tell if we'll be able to help with that. But again, this is a, a, a dynamic uh, keep one nerve two GSR that we're observing. And uh, we'll keep you apprised uh, on that. All right, now, the, um, that's why I believe GSR is very important. GST, that's your glutathione conjugation, how it takes out toxins. As we talked about mutations in GPX, uh, mutations in NERF2, any mutations in SOD1, 2, or 3, or catalase. And again, for the doctors who are on here or the health professionals, we've just upgraded our software. Uh, the National Institute of Health has determined which of the SNPs are really most significant that can actually be evidence-based or pathological. And we've now uh, isolated those to show which ones that might have more impact, uh, giving us more ability to determine what's going on. That's how we discovered the GSR. There's one GSR that's considered pathological. And when that's mutated, that's when they really have a hard time taking their oxidized back to uh, reduced. All right, so here's another study that shows Hundreds of studies showing microwave changes in calcium fluxes and intracellular calcium signaling. Now, of course, you know, we all know that calcium is needed to, uh, to build bone, but used improperly, calcium can be very inflammatory. Now, there's something called the voltage-gated calcium channel, and that is how it sits on the outside of the cell and a slight voltage sends calcium in. Now you can have genetic mutations in these genes, and that means that voltage will send more calcium in. So what is EMF? It's a voltage, okay. So downstream effects, nitric oxide signaling, peroxynitrite, free radical formation, and oxidative stress. And in this study, and this is put out by Martin Paul, of course, who's very well known, he said it's time for a paradigm shift away from only thermal effects towards voltage-gated calcium channel activation and the consequent downstream effects. Uh, this is a, a, a snip from my, uh, from my software where we actually look at the calcium voltage channels. It seems as though these two in the middle are quite common to be heterozygous and don't seem to be a problem. Heterozygous means one parent. Homozygous means both parents. These two seem to be more severe, and you can look at even among sick people, this only shows up 3% and 2.7% of the time. Invariably, these people are very sensitive to EMF. And then here's another pattern where there's three. So by looking at these calcium voltage channels, you can get a clue if that voltage channel, I, and I'm not quite sure how this works. I mean, Martin Paul knows more than I do, but I make the simple analogy that the gate is a little floppy Mm -hmm. and voltage pushes calcium in a little bit more robustly. Uh, I've never seen genetic mutations that are that accurate, because many times mutations are a predisposition, could be effective, maybe not. We found these to be uh, very effective. Now, here's what happens. Here is 
the calcium voltage channel, CAC, NA1C. This is the cell membrane. Here's calcium. When you've got this mutate, in other words, it's weak, EMF comes along, pushes more of the calcium in. As we said, that stimulates the nitric oxide. Then EMF, as we already showed you, stimulates superoxide. Superoxide and nitric oxide, oh no, peroxynitrite. So if you've got weakness in glutathione peroxidase or glutathione in general, or you don't have enough SOD, we're going to make more peroxynitrite damages your DNA. Now, a couple of nutrients are fascinating. Cat's claw is a, is a natural calcium channel blocker. Of course, magnesium balances calcium and vitamin K2 is needed for the proper delivery and use of calcium. Uh, SOD, catalase, resveratrol, and rosemary help SOD. Witch hazel, rosemary, grapeseed extract, and selenium sop up some of your peroxynitrite. So those are nutrients that you can use to actually slow down this in addition to staying away from your, uh, from your, uh, from your EMF. Now, we want to talk a little bit about peroxynitrite. I think we spoke about this in our very first, I think it was our first interview that we spoke about peroxynitrite. So if someone wants to learn more, go back and, and watch that one. But the cliff notes, peroxynitrite produced from nitric oxide and superoxide has been proposed to cause neuronal dysfunction and cell death in aging and age-related degenerative diseases. Three, nitrotyrosine, an oxidation product of tyrosine by peroxynitrite, was reported to increase in degenerating brains. That's a scary thought. Now, interesting, calcium channel blockers block EMF effects and several types of additional evidence confirm this mechanism. So calcium channel blockers could actually be supportive of that. Now, this is interesting. There's a, there's a molecule called uh, hirsutine. I'm probably not saying that right, but it actually comes from cat's claw. It is concluded that this from cat's claw, this is the botanical name, common name, inhibits that calcium voltage channel blocking activity, mainly through inhibition of the voltage dependent calcium influx. So cat's claw, which has been around for a long time, it comes from a tree that grows in South America. It's been used for immune system and other things historically. And here it is, it's a calcium channel blocker. Wow. I love that, Bob, because practically speaking, I use it all the time to treat Borrelia and also Epstein-Barr. And I'm sure that that's a bacteria and a virus, but it's very powerful in, in conjunction with other herbs for each of those things. And for Borrelia, I use it with other herbs. And then for Epstein-Barr, I combine it with sometimes like monolaurin or lysine, or, but it's very, very effective for both of those infections, probably mm -hmm. for immune support and stimulation. But who knows if there's this effect on calcium channel blocking that also promotes um, the immune system. Well, it may be multifactorial and, that, and that's the beauty of the things that God put on the earth for us. They're, they're very complex. Totally speculating here, but clearly peroxynitrite suppresses the immune system. Mm -hmm. So if by blocking the, you know, having a calcium channel blocking and that reduces the peroxynitrite, potential that that could be another factor as to, uh, as to why it's helpful. So here it says, um, the major active component showed rosemary acid to have strong ability to scavenge peroxynitrite. So here they're saying in this article, these scavengers might be developed as therapeutic drugs for presenting, preventing uh, peroxynitrite involved diseases. So I guess what they're suggesting is, you know, can the pharmaceuticals somehow synthesize the active ingredient, uh, but it's already there in, uh, in rosemary acid. Then uh, here there's an article that says the radioprotective effect of rosemary acid against mobile phone and Wi-Fi radiation induced oxidative stress in the, in the uh, brains of rats. Mm -hmm. So here they're saying there's a significant elevation of nitric oxide and significant reduction in glutathione, glutathione peroxidase, total antioxidant capacity, SOD and catalase in the RF radiation exposed rat's brain compared to the control group. Hang on to your hat, rosemary acid reduced the levels of nitric oxide, elevated glutathione peroxidase, superoxide dismutase, catalase, and glutathione levels in the rat brains in the, R, in the uh, radio and Wi-Fi groups compared to the, uh, to the other group. So bottom line of this study is that 
Rosemary acid can be considered a useful candidate for protecting brain tissues against RF radiation induced oxidative stress. So who'd have thunk, you know, just this, um, this simple thing that uh, has been on the earth could have that kind of an impact. I mean, when you think about, you know, elevates all of these things, that's astonishing when you really think of it. And, um, uh, you know, what a miracle that is, that something that uh, the God put on the earth for us can be, uh, can be that helpful. Now, we also show that witch hazel has shown the strongest effect for scavenging peroxynitrite. Not even going to try to say that. The major active uh, component of witch hazel bark was shown to have a strong ability to scavenge the peroxynitrite. It is suggested this might be developed as an, an effective peroxynitrite scavenger, for the prevention of uh, peroxynitride involved diseases. So that's why in some of the formulas that I put together for uh, EMF, mm -hmm. let's put those in there. Let's put some cat's claw, some SOD, some witch hazel, some rosemary, uh, put them all together. Now, selenium, this is almost a no brainer. We know that selenium is needed to, uh, you know, recycle your glutathione. And here they're saying that nano selenium could improve cognitive impairments of mice exposed to RF by increasing antioxidants, decreasing free radicals, and the changes they make uh, to the cerebral neurotransmitters. And, uh, you know, we don't get as much selenium as we should either. Now, this is interesting. Um, and again, I would encourage people to watch our interview on IL-6. Mm -hmm. uh, I can't tell you how many of my own uh, clients and others have just loved that interview that we did. That's... Uh, mm -hmm. That's going to be a tough act to follow, but <laughs> I know we just we real I we did outdid ourselves. I totally I'll, I'll be sure to put a link for all you listening, both on YouTube, on the Facebook, everywhere this is posted, because that was really worth um, your time to watch the IL six one. I'm going to be sure and link that up, Bob. Okay, sounds good. So here they did a study: 112 employees of a power plant, as the exposed group, and 138 unexposed were enrolled in a study. Pro-inflammatory cytokines, including IL-6 and tumor necrosis factor, were measured. Conclusion, long-term exposure to these EMFs affects the immune responses by stimulating the production of these pro-inflammatory cytokines. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm just going to very briefly, extremely briefly, talk about them. But I, again, I watch, the, watch that link, because in case anybody says, what's a cytokine? <laughs> here's, here's the cliff notes. Uh, there are a class of chemical mediators involved signaling between cells, inter meaning between, leuk, reference to the leukocytes. They're a cytokine, and they're signaling molecules that aid cell-to-cell -cell communication. And again, needed, but in excess, a problem. Uh, some are involved not only in the uh, initiation, but the persistence of pathologic pain by directly activating sensory neurons. And some are involved in nerve injury inflammation, induced central sensitization, and peripheral inflammatory responses. Um, now, this is an interesting study. Uh, and we talked about this in the, in the other interview we did. I'm just showing just this slide. When comparing successfully aging individuals to those with aging-related diseases disability, there was lower IL-6 levels in the successfully aging group. Longer survival was associated with lower concentrations. Conclusion of the study, IL-6 and CRP levels were good predictors of physical and cognitive performance and the risk of mortality in the both the entire elderly population and in successfully aging individuals. And this was a huge study of thousands of, of people, not just a quick. And then IL-6 was consistently related to all-cause mortality independent of the levels of adjustment and showing a dose response relationship between IL-6 and risk of death. IL-6 is a powerful predictor of all cause mortality in male elderly community dwellings. Now, again, back to COVID, uh, during a meta-analysis and systematic review, elevated IL-6 levels were found to be significantly associated with adverse clinical outcomes. Now, let's look at what we just said before. There's a NOx relationship. Well, NOx stimulates IL-6. IL-6 stimulates NOx. There was a reported 2.9-fold increase in mean IL-6 concentrations in complicated COVID-19 cases. One other study, interleukin-6 is one of the main mediators of inflammatory and immune response initiated by infection or injury, and increased levels of IR-6 
are found in more than one half of patients with COVID-19. The IL-6 is associated with inflammatory response, respiratory failure, needing for mechanical ventilation, and or intubation and mortality in COVID-19 patients. Now, guess what IL-6 mutations are? Gain of function. Uh. So when wow. you've got homozygous mutations in IL-6, they may lead to gain of function. Now what gain of function means is the IL-6 is quicker to be made. These twos on here mean that these individuals got a mutation from both mother and father. Just observing, as we see people who have a lot of mutations, they have a lot of inflammation, you know, jumping from one doctor to another, desperately trying to find a result and not having much success until we start addressing this overactive interleukin-6. Now, we showed this in the last time, so I'm not going to go into a lot of detail. But again, watch that video. Mm -hmm. We showed all the environmental factors that will stimulate interleukin-6, all the internal things that will do it, some of the things that will inhibit it. Okay. Um, and hydrogen water, top of the list here, thiamine, riboflavin, black human seed oil, apigenin from parsley and chamomile, pine bark, oxytocin, hug a family member or your dog, PEMF, uh, vitamin D, the good fats. And again, we go through all that in that uh, one hour and 15 minute interview. But just briefly here, you can see that IL-6 stimulates NOx, NOx stimulates mast cells, mast stimulates histamine. Kit genes, if you got mutations here, they're going to be trigger happy, make more. One of the things I'm astonished is how many people have mutations in their ABP1 they don't make enough DAO to degrade histamine. Their MAO degrades histamine. Histamine and methyltransferase degrades histamine. And I don't know if we had an opportunity to talk about this, but we are very intrigued. Histidine decarboxylase takes histidine, an amino acid, from things like pork and beef and turns it into histamine. We're finding that when people have a mutation in these significantly uh, evidence-based HDCs, and they have mutations that they don't degrade their B6, these people often overproduce histamine. So how often do you see uh, elevated B6, uh, Dr. Jill? Um, I would say quite frequently, actually. <laughs> so yeah, this is a big deal. And I have always not always had the answers of exactly why that is. It's even some people who are not taking B6, which is even more puzzling, but that makes sense here. Yeah. Well, if we get a chance, I'll show you there, there's two genes that I'm very intrigued by, and uh, they are related to the degradation of, uh, of B6. And uh, well, why don't, we, why don't we do that? Why don't we just... Uh, yeah, let's do it. <laughs> let's do it. Let's pull in the, uh, the pyramid. This is the pyramid that we use. And there's a section called nutrient metabolism. And I don't know what we'll, uh, we'll find on this person. Uh, but uh, in the software, these are all the genes that are related to nutrient metabolism. And I'm just going to zip right on down here to, uh, to B6. Here's molybdenum. So when you've got mutations here, uh, you might need molybdenum to, uh, to support the, uh, the sulfite to sulfate conversion. Uh, if you have mutations in uh, thiamine, uh, very important to be supplementing with thiamine. Uh, riboflavin, same thing. Riboflavin, we, I think we spoke about that uh, last time. Yeah. And um, so here's your panathenic acid, and B6 is coming right up here. So for doctors who are doing any of this work, uh, keep an eye on these two right here. PDXP, degradation of vitamin B6. And I'm, I have my researchers on this. Uh, NBPF3, I'm very intrigued by this. This is part of clearing vitamin B6. We're very early on, but we are noticing that when people have mutations in these B6 clearance, they oftentimes have high levels of B6. And, you know, unfortunately, you know, sometimes people take multiple nutrients, they don't pay attention. You know, a lot of people say, you know, you don't have to worry about the B vitamins because they're water soluble, they'll be excreted. But what we're finding is that when people have mutations here, along with mutations in histidine decarboxylase, their histamine is through the roof. 
and they many times don't uh, recognize it. So for the doctors who are watching this, uh, keep an eye on NBPF3 and PDXP. Um, we're still researching this, so you know I don't want to say it's definitive, and you know maybe someday we can talk about this in more detail. But uh, we're I have a sneaking suspicion that mutations here, along with other things that don't allow you to clear your histamine. So, for example, if you've got uh, if you've got uh, a lot of histamine being produced, and you don't have enough. Uh, you don't have enough DAO, and maybe your HNMT is mutated, or you don't have SAMI, or you've got mutations in glucuronidation, and then on top of that, your HDC enzyme is cranking, turning histidine into histamine. Perfect storm. Mm -hmm. And uh, I believe this might be happening. And uh, interestingly, iodine, testosterone, and ECGC from uh, green tea temper this down. So what's happening to our testosterone levels, particularly in the men dropping, particularly in the, uh, in the, in the younger boys. And then COMT, catecholaminomethyltransferase, testosterone strengthens it, which clears dopamine and other nasty things. So for boys particularly, dropping testosterone can have a profound, profound impact. So anyway, and I'm sure you're, uh, you're probably noticing, uh, that uh, that uh, testosterone is dropping in boys mm -hmm. radically. Yeah. Now, what are some ways that we can uh, reduce that IL-6? Uh, during a meta-analysis, curcumin was found to reduce circulating IL-6 concentrations. Um, the lowering capacity was not even dependent upon the dose or duration of the supplementation. Um, here, another analysis, pycnogenol was found to decrease CRP and have an anti-inflammatory action. Um, here's a thiamine and riboflavin. They will actually help the anti-inflammatory activity of dexamethasone and reduce production of tumor necrosis factor alpha and IL-6. And then good old black human seed oil. Uh, the bottom line of this study was that uh, significantly reduces interleukin-6. So those are all things that people can take that will reduce the interleukin-6. But on the other hand, you have to do things that uh, that also, uh, you know, reduce the overproduction of it. And Bob, I uh, know I mentioned this last time, but black cumin seed is a favorite for clostridia. So that's another treatment option that we use. Uh, again, you need to consult your doctor. We're not giving medical advice, but there's other benefits. I've had a real um, good luck with the gut and excess clostridia with black cumin seed. And I think that's why some people think that they're allergic to it or can't handle it because yeah, of doing yeah. the die off. Yeah. Uh, now this one blows me away. Apigenin or some people say apigenin mm -hmm. found in parsley and chamomile has been shown to enhance the expression of glutathione, uh, glutathione synthase, catalase and SOD, inhibit an ADPH oxidase, increase NERF2, and strongly decrease IL-6. Parsley. Seriously? Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> but um, uh, who would have thought, and oh, the uh, this is the ingredient that, that's mm -hmm. in the parsley, but also on chamomile. I mean, when you think about it, what such a simple food has such impact on us? So uh, sprinkle that parsley on your food. Mm -hmm. But uh, I'm, I'm a big fan of, uh, of supplementing with, uh, with parsley. And selenium, you know, we spoke about that uh, li multiple linear regression analysis shows that serum selenium was significantly inversely associated with interleukin-6 after adjusting for potential confounding factors. Of course, it would make sense because if it helps your uh, glutathione recycle, uh, you're going to uh, have more glutathione available and reduce the inflammatory cascade. Now, I'd like to mention that uh, we're having another conference in 2021 and Dr. Jill, you and I have to talk about if uh, maybe we can uh, have you participate in that again. Our subject is going to be cytokines, heavy metals, plastics, and oxalates. Schedule and everything is still uh, in progress, but if you're a health professional or just somebody who wants to lurk and listen, mm -hmm. uh, nutrogenicresearch.org. Uh, and for health professionals, uh, we do have software that uh, 
It's called Your Genomic Resource, the genetic test. We have our functional genomic line, software that interprets it, and we have uh, education. So if you're a health professional uh, and think that adding this to what you're doing uh, is helpful, uh, you know, check it out. Uh, if, if you're not a health professional, you know, we, we only work with, uh, you know, licensed doctors or naturopaths or other <clears throat> certified people on this. So this is not for the, uh, the general public. Online certification course, uh, nutrigeneticresearch.talonlms.com. Anybody can take this. Obviously, you can't, uh, you know, use the information if you're not qualified to do so. But a lot of people just they think this is interesting. They can they can take the course, and a lot of people want to know how to get a hold of us. Uh, we do health coaching in our office. There's our phone number and our website. The doctors who are on here that uh, want to learn functional genomic analysis, functionalgenomicanalysis.com. Uh, Yvonne Lucchese is the executive uh, director. And she or some of the sales staff can uh, can help you out. So, bottom line, uh, let's me stop this screen share here. Stop the share. There we go. So, bottom line, uh, EMF is uh, hurting us in many many ways. As we talked about, it initiates the Fenton reaction. It uh, it does the uh, the NOS uncoupling by creating more peroxynitrite and stimulates uh, IL six. So, as you said, some common things to do. Keep that cell phone away from you. Don't charge it next to your bed. Mm -hmm. um, I personally uh, got a little Faraday cage for my Wi-Fi so that it reduces the amount of EMF. Uh, use those uh, air, air uh, buds rather than, uh, than, uh, than, the, uh, than the Bluetooth. Uh, try not to spend a lot of time next to your Wi-Fi machine. Uh, some people are concerned about the, uh, the meter on the outside of their house. Uh, some people can get the electric company to go back to, you know, traditional reading, or you can get uh, cages to put over them and just use some, uh, some common sense. One of the things that concerns me the most is when uh, people stream to their television set. Mm -hmm. So when you get a text message or an email blip, you know, not much, but when you're streaming to your TV, that's a lot of EMF. And one of my concerns is, particularly if the router is between you and the television set, all that's uh, passing through you. So I think we're going to find over time that uh, EMF is not this uh, benign little thing that uh, brings us the world. But uh, I have a sneaking suspicion we're going to have a big oops to all of this someday. So the best we can do is avoid. And uh, personally, I sleep in a 5G block bag every night. There's a there's a sleeping bag that you can get that uh, is made out of silver threads and protects you. And uh, just some common sense things to try to stay away a little bit, make sure your antioxidants are working well, and uh, try to do the best you can in a, what may be a relatively uh, tough situation. Bob, this is such great information. Thank you so much for all the hard work you and your team have done to share it. And uh, again, I could be more excited as we partner together and to support your um, your educational platforms and all that. Um, and I would just add same thing. Don't keep your phone next to your body. Do not keep it on or charging at night. I always recommend airplane mode and if possible, charge it in another room at night. Um, and then there are some devices that I found useful. Um, there are so many out there. These are just the ones I use on my phone here. This little guy that's called an Aries tech. I'll put a link to um, where you can get that. And then the brand new one that the Aries tech company has is called a life shield. And that's this little guy right here. And these, these, this company has over 200 IBM patents um, as far as the background and the EMF protectiveness. This thing can be stuck in this little pocket and worn around your neck. Um, and again, I wasn't actually planning on showing these. That's why you saw me lean down. because I'm like, I'm gonna just show this stuff because this is what I use. Um, nothing is as good as keeping the cell phone away from your body, um, working with your practitioner to have nutrients that protect you. But all these things can be super helpful. And, I've, and they have now, I don't have it with me, but my dogs actually have dog game of protectors. <laughs> um, so you can actually get these for your dogs. This life tune is the brand new one. It's, um, it's extra. It's like 30 times more powerful for 5g, especially. So the life tune series with Aries tech has been, um, uh, geared towards the 5g protection. And that's the line that has the dog tags and has, um, these guys here. This is 50 square feet. The dog tags are 12 square feet. So around your little, your pet, um, and then the phone ones and there's, they have lots of devices. And I also often wear a bioelectric shield. That's like an, it looks like a necklace, a medallion. 
Um, I personally have actually just felt better. So I, I'm not an uh, electrical engineer. I am not the person that I, I know the bioscience of the human body. So I am not your expert on EMF devices, but I'm just telling you stuff that I use personally and I found to be helpful for my physical well-being. Also, you've heard me talk about PEMF mats and people are like, oh, isn't that worse? I have found patients with severe EMF sensitivity that mimics the, the earth's surface, so earthing and grounding and PEMF, pulsed electric magnetic frequency, I have found to be incredibly helpful. Um, and it's funny, my little story, you've probably heard me talk about this before, but my friend um, naturopath has a $20,000 PEMF mat. So I was like, oh, that's out of the range for myself and most people that I know, right? That's really, really expensive investment. But higher doses really recently made one that was very simple under a thousand dollars. And I, that's the one I use. So it's quite affordable in the relativeness of PEMF mats. And so I really have liked the, the higher dose PEMF mat. Again, I'll link to the products we love page so you guys can see and check this out yourself. I feel like it's an affordable option. In fact, I like it so much. I bought my staff them for Christmas and my family. So I've purchased a lot of these because I actually believe in them and they work. Um, so check those things out, see what works for you. Um, I, and, and again, the other stuff, just keeping it away from your body, taking the nutrients. Um, so, so many things out there to do. And Bob, thank you so much for your time, your expertise today. As always, it's been a joy. It's been a full ride of great information. Um, we'll be sure and share this. So thank you all for joining us today. My pleasure to be here.